Guillermo Martinez is one of Argentina's most important contemporary writers. His first book of stories, Vast Hell, was the winner of the National Funding for the Arts Award, one of Argentina's most prestigious, and it has become required reading in many high schools. Several stories have been translated into English. His first novel, Regarding Rodderer, was included in a collection of the best Argentinian literature of the century. He's probably best known in the English-speaking world for the Oxford Murders, which won the Planeta Prize and was adapted into a movie starring John Hurt in 2006. Translation rights were sold in more than 30 countries. His essays and reviews appear regularly in La Nación and other leading newspapers. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you very much. Your father was an unpublished writer. Your mother was a literature professor. Borges' father published just one novel, Mm -hmm. but had much greater ambitions, as did his mother, who made it her goal for her family to regain its former glory. So there were high expectations placed on Louis, which caused some anxiety, and I wonder if you felt any of this. No, not really, because uh, my father was uh, quite... uh good humor the guy um, he didn't make literature to us as a burden so he really enjoyed telling us uh, stories and shows and half invented tales or he liked very much cinema so he was uh, the one of the founders of the what is called here uh, cine clubs uh, cine, cinema clubs yeah and he would um, represent for us, as an acting, uh, the scenes he had seen uh, of the movies. So that mm. was very amusing for us. So in general, uh, literature for me and my siblings uh, was um, a region of pleasure. And I didn't ever feel the the urge to to write or something like that. He liked to promote in me and my sister and brothers um, the habit of reading and writing. It was not uh, his ambition that uh, any of us would become a writer. More than that, uh, when it comes uh, the time to choose a career to pursue uh, in, at the university, um, he would prefer for us uh, any career that could uh, make some money for our lives. Right. So we, we could uh, live uh, uh, without uh, too many travels. Because he had the idea that uh, literature is something that you can always do on your own. No, you can always read on your own, write on your own. Mm. So, Which is what he did, right? And that is what he did. He had a title as an agronomy engineer. And on the side of that, he studied mathematics, literature, philosophy, and uh, economy. He read uh, quite a lot uh, along his whole life. So that was, in many senses, my model as well. So I did uh, the career of mathematics, but I always had a parallel life in reading and writing. Uh, You mentioned, and maybe it's just the translation, but you mentioned somewhere that Mathematics showed up as a strange accident. How's but that? It was because um, my idea was to pursue a career um, in the humanities side, uh, like uh, philosophy or literature. Maybe philosophy will, will be my my choice. But I started um, electrician in- engineering. That was what I uh, chose to earn my life. Yeah, it's pretty uh, practical, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. Very soon I realized that I was not going to be that kind of uh, professional. But uh, I learned in the beginning of the career, I learned... Um, I had wonderful math teachers and I could see some, something of um, these areas that I like uh, uh, in maths, you know, um, 
the paradoxes of logic, uh, the diversity of infinities, uh, and this kind of subjects that also Borges liked uh, quite a lot. And that was the, the link uh, for me to, uh, to decide uh, that uh, path. You know? uh, in, instead of uh, changing to philosophy, I rather prefer to study uh, mathematical logic. And you got your PhD and you were... Yeah, a scholarship to do some studies in Oxford. I had two wonderful years in Oxford. I, I got something of the spirit of uh, that place. Uh, and that was so uh, great for me because um, at some point I could uh, get back to, to those places in my writing. Yeah, maybe you could uh, explain exactly how mathematics informed your your writing. Well, uh, it's uh, I never thought that uh, in fact there was such a, a strong relation between my my way of doing math and my writing. I'm not sure what would happen if I arise from my cover the information that I am a mathematician. I'm not sure if uh, readers will uh, feel anything different from any other book. Other uh, than, of course, the Oxford uh, well, uh, murders. Well, in murders, and also in the last one, the Alice's uh, murders, there is the atmosphere of uh, mathematicians. Uh, yeah. the, the places... Uh, the, um, the smoke talk of mathematicians, but uh, in fact anyone with some kind of technical information could have uh, written the same thing. Also, uh, the, uh, I always uh, thought myself as a short stories writer yeah. uh, during my whole life. When I started when I was seven years old and I don't feel that I write in a very different way. Right now, with my mathematical developments uh, and my readings and all of that, the, the essential thing is uh, once and again uh, to imagine some kind of uh, short story and later on this story develops into something bigger. Uh, but in the uh, in the core of the uh, of the situation, there is always uh, this kind of first uh, insight of of something that will be a short story in the beginning. Most of my novels um, grew up uh, from short stories. You couldn't necessarily fit the big idea into that small form, so it developed into a longer. Well. The procedure will be this. Uh, I start as a sh the, my tale as a short story in general. And at some point, maybe there is um, a, a seed of uh, something which uh, we call the theoretical line. There is some kind of abstract uh, notion that starts to develop in parallel with the plot. Yeah. And when I feel uh, the need to to enlarge that theoretical part, uh, then I know I am into a novel. I, I, I have to develop it as a novel. That, that is the, the way it works for me. Okay. And sometimes this uh, theoretical side does not uh, show off, and then it, it closes as a short story. Just thinking about it... Uh, about the possible impact of mathematics on writing fiction. Yes. It seems to me that maybe what you were able to do was to take, for example, the details of different well-known proofs and substitute uh, characters for numbers and plot twists for formulas? No, no, not at all. Not no, at all. No, okay. no, no, it is not my goal or my feeling about the thing. No, mathematics comes into the game in a different way. It is, uh, it provides a way of looking at some problems uh, in a way that challenge the common sense. That is uh, what I like about math. There are many moments in my novels uh, where the mathematical mind will uh, 
challenge the obvious uh, ways of uh, thinking. And, and that is what is intriguing to me and I hope to my readers. Uh, for example, there is a saying, uh, if there is an animal that uh, barks, uh, moves uh, very quickly the tail and has uh, four legs, uh, it should be a dog. Yeah. So a mathematician will, will say, no, it's not enough. It may be not at all. Could be a hyena. <laughs> well, uh, there are many possibilities. Could be a well-performed toy, for example. <laughs> but this is much deeper in some sense. This has to be with uh, the way human beings uh, jump to conclusions. The problem it's of easy induction. For them to, to, yes, it's, and the it's... The problem of induction. So and how habits. many examples do yeah. you need? to jump to a conclusion, to form yourself a concept of something. So it is a really deep uh, problem. Uh, my previous novel, The Oxford Murders, and this one, The Al Alice's Murders, uh, deal with this uh, fact that is called the paradox of the finite rules by uh, Wittgenstein, Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein. So he studied uh, exactly uh, how do we learn? You know, uh, teachers just show you uh, some uh, amount of examples and they expect uh, that at some point you, inside of your head, uh, somewhere, someone calls you Eureka and you see the truth of the example. Well, that is a very... Um, that is something very difficult to precise, to put in a kind of... Uh, precise way. How many examples do you need? Uh, which kind of examples? How many corrections? Are you really understanding the rule or you seem to be understanding the rule? It seems to me that, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, if you're in the habit of, you know, seeing that or expecting it, sure. then that's what you're going to think it's going to be. That's but but math says otherwise. Yes. Um, when. I, I give a very frequently um, a talk which is, which is called, uh, it is entitled Logic Series and uh, Series of Murders. And I always give to the audience the following example. Suppose uh, someone gives to you the series uh, 2, 4, 8, 16. People jump to say 32, okay? but. Immediately I show them that there is a wonderful, reasonable uh, conclusion that says 31 instead of 32. So 32 is the one that we were taught in the schools, you know, the rule of multiplying by 2. Mm -hmm. And there is another one made of circles and points that gives you 2, 4, 8, 16 and 31. And it is even more elementary, you know? It's a socially accepted answer. Sure, that, is, that was the idea of Wittgenstein. That in fact, following our rules is related to a, which, which he calls the, a game of language between a student and a teacher who will uh, guide you it is not something that you can read from the examples directly. Uh, there are many options from the same examples. Yeah. And you are guided into a distinguished one. But that's, uh, that opens uh, an, an abyss of uh, uncertainty. This sort of habit of thought, you can go wrong with that. Just because that's the way that you've been taught to think doesn't mean that that's the right way to think. Um, the point is that there is no one right way. Yeah. That's the crucial point. And that has an influence in many uh, fields. It is not just a logical problem. Yeah. It has uh, uh, consequences in the law. The spirit, uh, the, what is written uh, as law and the interpretation of the law. Mm -hmm. It has a uh, consequence in uh, languages. Uh, suppose you, you want to uh, send to the author uh, space, uh, some kind of cipher of language, of human language. How could you recognize if 
you are going to be understood by a, a known human mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, it has a consequence in the translate in the translation game. Suppose that you arrive to an island uh, of Indian people and they never met a foreign person. Uh, this is a problem that I approach in my uh, last book, uh, Alice's Murder. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the the Indian guy uh, points uh, to um, a white rabbit uh, which is running, and he says, "Gabagai." That is a, a real mental experiment by William Quain, or a logician. So, what should you write as a translation? Maybe you guess, your first guess is that Gabagai means rabbit, but you are not going ever be sure that you, uh, that you got the right uh, meaning. But for uh, a certain number of peop people would, uh, uh, would understand that and accept that, but others wouldn't? No, you are not sure. Uh, suppose that you guess the way that they have uh, or the words for yes or no or not. But Gabagai could be food, uh, white color, hunt, hunt uh, season, could be rabbit in the run, but there's a something, something different meaning for rabbit in the, in, on the plate, okay? On the, on the plate, on oh the yes, plate. Out, so, a wild rabbit versus the, the, the uh, fish. Each. And, well, you have fish for both, but we have uh, pez and pescado. Pez, it is alive. Pescado, it is dead. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So there are. Gabagai could be the name of the only rabbit in the island, or right. there could be thousands of uh, rabbits, and there is a very tiny classifications of uh, rabbits uh, that you don't know. So what, what, point, what is, point are you making? The, the point is that there is no way of asking once and again, if, uh, even if you get the answer yes or no when you point different things, you are not going ever to be sure that Gabagai is the real name they have for rabbits as we have the name rabbits uh, for this animal. For example, uh, let, let, so, so you, maybe you, you will get the, the point here. Suppose that a non-human being comes to Earth yeah. and he looks and sees that each time that you say you sniff, you, that anyone sniffs, the word it says is uh, bless you. He will think that uh, the word that bless you means sniff. Right. Okay? And it is not uh, like that. Okay? Right. Uh, so in, this, in the same way, they could be saying Gabagai as a kind of magical word because maybe rabbits are considered a bad fortune. And you okay. say that to protect yourself. Yes, for yeah. example. Yeah. And how could you... How could you distinguish uh, that? And even if you distinguish that, there could be another uh, meaning. Okay. So you, uh, that, that is called the uh, radical impossibility of translation. But again, it is the same game that no matter how many steps of the series you have achieved, uh, you are not going to be sure about what is the real meaning behind the series. Yeah, you won't, you're not sure of the intention of the person that spoke that word. Yes, the interpretation, which is, uh, no matter what, how many examples you have. Yes, I guess there's always the possibility that it's wrong. Yes, that there is some other thing. But where, I'm just trying to remember why we, why we went down this rabbit hole. Because I am trying to explain to you the whole field of consequences of the problem of the logical series. So uh, it has consequences in, in the law, in the education, uh, in the idea of the possibility of a um, perfect uh, language. There were uh, during centuries different uh, attempts 
to create a perfect language, mm -hmm. which means an artificial, artific artificial way of syntax. Uh, syntax. Who will create by itself the meanings? Okay, uh, Borges uh, has a wonderful article about that. It is called the uh, Analytic Idiom of uh, John Wilkins, and all of those attempts uh, are condemned to this paradox of by Wittgenstein. So there are many consequences of this game of following a series. And the where we started off was the fact that sometimes the obvious explanation is wrong. Yes. This, what it seems to be the obvious continuation to a series is wrong. Yes. Okay. Uh, there are others. And so, uh, in your work, you play around with that. In my work, uh, I wrote two novels uh, dealing with this kind of uh, subtle, subtle uh, facts around logical series. Uh, and I take advantage of the, uh, what is called, series of murders. In fact, no, mm -hmm. the, the, my novels are novels about series of murders. They're always about a series? Well, in these two last novels, uh, you have two series. Okay. Yes. Not Why only. not just one? Because a series is more interesting and you get clues and uh, well, the interplay I, between I, the murder I, and the... I wanted to show this fact about series. Okay. No, maybe the third one will be different. It's, it's very interesting uh, to compare South American writing, which seems to revel in the fact that there is no objective truth, mm -hmm. and English language fiction, which you play around with uh, fantasy and uh, illogical situations, and it just pisses the reader off. I may, I may be generalizing here too much, but the English language reader doesn't have as much time for all sorts of different possible truths. Yes. They're much more concerned with rational proof. Well, I was surprised uh, in that sense when my, translator, my translators in English were very preoccupied uh, about uh, how much of uh, real documented uh, facts uh, were in my novel. No? So they wanted to check everything. Mm. And I, I would say at some point, well, this is a fiction. This is not intended as a history book. Yeah. M maybe not uh, everything is uh, perfect in the, the uh, real detail. So we are quite accustomed to, to move a little on the sides of uh, r real facts uh, because of the influence of uh, Borges in our literature. He will be very precise uh, in some facts, but he had always some room to fake uh, little details uh, in favor of uh, his fictions. Yeah, but that, George Orwell did that, apparently. Uh, and it upsets people to think, because it's how you label it. If you label it as non-fiction, yes. you're not allowed to do that. Well, uh, But he did it anyway. In the end of my recent novel, I, I inserted a kind of notice to warn people from Oxford that I wrote this novel uh, with offer in my memory and not uh, checking every detail and that maybe I have invented some, you know, heights uh, uh, that are not there. Uh, <laughs> then that, but, uh, but that's okay in fiction. I think so, but then uh, I, I prefer to, to be clear about that. <laughs> yes, okay. Because I had some experience with my first novel in Oxford, I received uh, letters from people in Oxford saying to me, well, but policemen in Oxford uh, don't show uh, guns or things like that. And that kind of that ruins the experience for them. If they read that and, it, and he's got a gun, 
and that's not how it is. Yes, but uh, two or three years later, uh, we had the, <laughs> the Twin Towers and everything changed. And in London, they will kill a man without... Uh, <laughs> exactly. You, you remember that yeah, uh, yeah. in the train, in the subway. They yeah. run after a man and they kill it in front of everyone. <laughs> So <laughs> things can change very quickly. That's right. <laughs> uh, let me, speaking of uh, Borges, let me, if I could, uh, just quote you something from uh, Edwin Williamson's biography. Yes. And uh, he said, or he writes, Lacking objective truth, man was condemned to play in a game of no fixed rules and no specific end. For if the existence of beings other than oneself was uncertain, the presence of God or a hidden demiurge could not be ruled out. The act of writing was a paradigm of existence. The author might invent characters and plots, but was he the true source of his inventions? Or did they simply reflect patterns repeated endlessly throughout universal literature? In the face of such radical uncertainties, the reader was invited to question personality, meaning, and ultimately objective reality itself. I am an atheist, so um, Borges as well was uh, a non-believing guy but he played a lot with the fact that one could think of um, some kind of the 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 deity the uh, how the word uh, another name for god deity deity, deity. yeah yes he has for example the poem chess god uh, moves the the, the, the pieces, pawns yes, the pieces yes, yeah yes. And also in uh, in the short story, the circular ruins. Okay, you you remember that is a kind of demiurge that creates a, a man up of, from his uh, dreams. During his dreams, he will create a man, and then at some point uh, he feels that he is going to to die in flames, in a kind of fire. And when he steps into the, the fire, uh, the fire is not uh, hitting him. Okay. And he realizes that he's the dream of someone higher. Yes. Okay? So this game, is, uh, he plays it once and again. So even when he was an atheist, he liked to play with the idea of uh, God uh, creating creatures and being created with which is which is a gnostic idea in fact the, the root of that is a gnostic idea yeah. that there are levels of the di- divinities well, he, there he, is also a, there is one else, one more poem by him which is called uh, the golem and again the the jew is uh, creating the this uh, kind of uh, uh, human which is not very smart and uh, on top of him uh, God has created uh, the human beings and he's not satisfied as well with his creation that is the idea it's, kind, it's a kind of ironic uh, poem mm-hmm. uh, have you read that uh, did you read because that that is a wonderful one of because it is very ironic very nice poem. it's called the golem, uh, it's called the golem. yeah yes. I cannot translate it. No, uh, no. Okay. Chess is wonderful as well. Okay. These are two of his most famous uh, poems. He also was able to, or felt that it was okay to bring fantasy into non-fiction. Sure. He, that would be his uh, predilect uh, material. Uh, so mm-hmm. the, this mix of... Uh, Real facts and some kind, some twist of fantasy. Do you think that he was that influential to, as I say, the difference between sort of a South American reader and a North American reader? 
is this acceptance of unreality and fantasy. That is is, is uh, it him that, like, before no, that? No, no, uh, he was one of a school of writers uh, dealing with uh, genres. He liked very much uh, the crime genre. Uh, yeah, he so, loved the detective story. Sure, and, yeah. uh, the, there is a whole collection he organized with Vio Casares, which is called the Seventh Circle, referring to the Seventh Circle of... Uh, Dante? Uh, yes, yeah. which, which is the Circle of Murderers. But he was one in a whole school, uh, Silvino Campo, Vio Casares, uh, Marco de Nevi, that was the kind of literature that was done uh, in the 60s and 70s. But he, he affected the taste. Sure, he did, uh, because, Be- because uh, he was a great uh, teacher of readings. Yeah. Because he pointed out uh, many English authors that English people wouldn't uh, read them that much uh, at that point. For example, uh, Chesterton, Chesterton yeah. for example, Stevenson, for example, Wilkie Collins. And also the, there was a very important influence uh, about the writing. Because we are very different in South America from the way that uh, Spanish writers uh, approach the writing. So they will go to, to the writing as masters of the whole language and we we write in a kind of selected field of the dictionary that it, this is similar to what happened with, in the relation between english uh, people and american people american people will think of themselves as uh, more to the point uh, more direct may, may, maybe less sophisticated in the selection of words yeah, I mean, Hemingway was very... Yes, straight Curt, and, yes. yeah. In a different way, but we, the Argentinian writers, are not, we are not going to use the whole dictionary. We are going to keep apart, to keep distance from many words that sound to us as uh, too Spanish. And we will uh, count with uh, really uh, less amount of words. The same words, but just fewer of them? Fewer. fewer. Why is that? Well, because uh, there are many words that to our ears sound too Spanish. I don't know. Yeah, Uh, I was going to say... They they, they don't sound as, as the ones we will choose in a, in our life they they are words that are there just in some books there, yeah they, they, okay. we have an adjective for that it is libresca a word that is li, a, a libresca word means it's a word you only find in books and in books all books coming from spain it's so, it's ironic though because what you're trying to do is to get closer to real life to, well, I think that some words are full of re- of life, and some other words are older, seems to us uh, archaic, uh, yeah. archaic, and and doesn't and don't fit many times in in different levels of language. Maybe you you will use them if you want to uh, recreate some kind of old talking or I don't know. Yeah, oh, but there is some other point uh, that Borges was very keen on. He liked very much the structure of the English uh, language. Yeah, his mother was English. Uh, yes, so he could do uh, quite an innovation in our language uh, by writing in a in a kind of classical way, with uh, reminds uh, some of the uh, classical English. Uh, novels uh, and he also uses in a very nice way uh, he, he has a way of uh, placing the adjectives uh, which comes from English there is a displacement so the, uh, the adjective uh, is not intended for the substantives or for the noun uh, but in fact, it affects uh, the following uh, now. 
Okay. Uh, okay, so it's a kind of weird way of, uh, but but it is very nice when 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 it gets to the point. No, uh, it is difficult for me to explain. explain yeah, yes, yeah. but it, it is very typical of of his writing. And again, uh, that had a big influence on this. Yes, yeah. that he he got that from the English language, and uh, and the Spanish obviously didn't have that influence. And after him, many uh, writers, many Argentinian writers, got his influence, and we will prefer to write in his uh, sober way, and not maybe in the called the, the Baroquian, how okay. the Baroquian, 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 yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the Baroquian way that Latinate. He, yeah. Yes, that was that was the new waves of. Uh, Alejo Carpentier, um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, no, uh, we didn't get that influence. Just Argentina. Just Argentina, yes. Yeah, okay, okay. One, one of the things that I find interesting is that uh, Canada, Canadians, define themselves against Americans. And this sounds to me like Argentinians defining themselves against the Spanish. No, no, not really against, but um, you want there to. Are, there are not many uh, influences in in the narrative uh, field. Maybe mm -hmm. there are more influences in poetry because yeah. Spain uh, had wonderful poets. Uh, so there are uh, long influences in poetry, but there are not that many in contemporary narratives. I see, okay. That is true. But, isn't but, this but it is not against, because uh, we are not uh, so interested in Spanish literature to be against that, if you understand. <laughs> it's not that important. It's not that influential for us. It is not our main battle. But, but, but what happens is that it is very difficult to, to be read in all uh, Latin American countries if you are not read first in Spain. So at some point you need to uh, get some success in Spain to be recognized by your brothers that but, are near. That's the same as Canada. If you're not recognized in the States, it's very difficult. But it seems to me that a big part of being Argentinian is to define your own identity. Now, here I'm, I'm, sure. I'm telling you what's important yes, in Argentina. No, I, I, <laughs> I'm not sure that we have uh, any problems of identities. Uh, it is supposed that we are the most arrogant people in the continent, you know. Arrogant? <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Why is uh, that? Why is that? I don't know. There is a. I think it's a matter of uh, the the city of Buenos Aires. Uh, there are a lot of uh, people, maybe in the city, we, which have uh, an opinion for every subject. You know? uh, yeah. A kind of loud opinion. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> a very firm opinion. But the, I, the other thing too, though, is that say the turn of the nineteenth to the twentieth century, but you know, eighteen nineties. Argentina was richer than Spain. Yes, and if you read, for example, this novel by Celine, uh, Trip to the End of the Night, uh, I'm not sure how I know it's one you mean, okay. The Journey to the End of the Night. The yeah. Journey to the End of the Night. At that point, uh, he was fed up about Argentinian going to France, uh, and they were the the richest people in the world, more or less. It's mm -hmm. what they were like Arabian people now, yeah. I don't yeah. know. Yes, uh, but I'm not sure if it comes uh, from that time or if it is... Uh, uh, I guess it could uh, have something to do that uh, our middle class is really big. We have a really big educated middle class and they go to travel to many different countries and they they get very proud about that. And they they feel superior to they, the rest of South America. Uh, yes, in some sense. Uh, money will do that, I guess. Money or this kind of um, 
tradition of traveling uh, mm. uh, abroad. So even mm. if they don't have money, they they get uh, from in some way or other. Uh, it is a some something that is very an important. Uh, uh, very important, yes. Uh, um, it is uh, very important in a kind of social status, no? Yeah. Uh, to to show you as a person that travels. Yeah, abroad, cosmopolitan. Uh, yes, com- yes, that is the point. And also, the it is true that. Wherever you go, there is at least one Argentinian guy there. And it is, <laughs> uh, that is that is a law. <laughs> and what you're able to? They're they're friendly with other Argentinians, and they'll sometimes, show you around. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. <laughs> um, they, sometimes they they want to be disguised as Uruguayan people, no? Because uh, we think that people in Uruguay are better than us. You do? Yes, we do. Really, they are. <laughs> It's funny if, if you're arrogant, I, I wouldn't see that you would uh, you would accept that. Well, uh, there are That's part, humble. part of us uh, <laughs> are not that way. So yeah, it's hard to generalize about a whole yeah, population. Yeah, sure. You, if you travel to the interior of the country, you are going to find yeah. wonderful people. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, how does it? Uh, Plato's idea of uh, forms, the the ideal effect you're writing. Do you, are you trying to create the perfect plot? That's interesting because uh, at some point when you are writing, you are, you are struggling with some kind of uh, ideal form that you you need to achieve. Uh, so, in some sense, I, I have, I think, any writer has that kind of uh, platonic idea in mind, that there has to be a, a better form, and you have to do something to conquer that form. So it's an ongoing uh, it, challenge. Yes, it's, uh, at, at some point uh, you are clarified when you are writing a novel, and you see the end, and you see that everything is, uh, is is getting the right place in the plot and in the puzzle of, of which is a novel. So are you, are you uh, attempting to create your own universe then? Sure, uh, each novel is a different little universe indeed, yes, and I believe in the uh, relative uh, autonomy of these worlds. And you make up the rules? Uh, some of the rules, of course, not every rule, because the reader has to to know uh, at some point uh, the rules. Uh, otherwise, it is totally uh, arbitrary. I'm just saying that uh, a detective fiction is as much about uh, the theory of of crime fiction as it is about fictional murders. So, uh, ratiocination, uh, deductive science, psychological insight, these are all important to most detective fiction. But then there's also intuition that goes beyond that. Do you bring that into your work? When I'm writing uh, crime novels, uh, there is always um, a moment for a brilliant idea. That, 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 that is important for the narrative, that the reader feels or that they are near of something that will clarify the whole picture. And I like um, very much this moment in classical uh, crime novels uh, where the detective uh, got the key idea and the reader still thinks well, but how can this idea relate to uh, to everything, or how this little idea will help to find the truth finally? So that is a moment uh, of challenge between the author and the reader that I like very much. And what there's a there is a logical explanation to it, or sometimes it's just nothing to do with logic. No, of course the author knows the logical explanation. It has to but be logical. He, he places it he, at some point in the plot where it is totally challenging for the reader 
to find out uh, which role will play that kind. Mm -hmm. That is part of the game. Also, the, the author uh, knows everything, and therefore yeah. uh, he God. can play in a quite safe way the key uh, hint. Okay. Uh, his detective will uh, pull the thread at the right moment, but it is there before for any reader to to try their uh, the detective mind. Just uh, finally, then you talk about the ideal. This ideal. Who's the uh, the novelist and, and short story writer that gets close to that, in your opinion? Closest. Borges, for example, gets uh, very close to that in many of his short stories. Anyone Borges. in particular? The Aleph, um, the South, one I like very much is uh, The Garden of the Forking Path. And why? Well, because um, they are subtle as stories and very subtle also in the philosophical meaning, in meanings and the resonances, the human resonances. Uh, uh, there are many other writers uh, who also get uh, perfect forms. For example, Cortázar in Julio Cortázar in mm -hmm. The Night uh, Upside Up. When you lie uh, on, on your top, uh, there's two ways of lying uh, on a bed. Mm, boca, boca arriba, like this. When you are lying like this on your in the bed. That's the title. The Night Upside Up, so I, I guess it will be. That's a wonderful short story. There is uh, some other stories. Uh, for example, The Monkey's uh, Po, La Pata de Mono. That's an English author. So in short stories, it is easier to get that feeling that uh, the perfect form has achieved. But it is a feeling, of course. Maybe some other writer will twist uh, some facts and orders and still you will have a wonderful story. Is there one defining feature that does it for you? Is it a feeling that you get? Or? Well, Borges wrote uh, an article about the laws of uh, crime uh, fiction. Yeah. And in the sixth law, the last one, he will say, necessity and wonder of the solution. Necessity. So yeah. the solution comes as, as something that is logical at some point, but also makes you this feeling of wonder, uh, like an, uh, in an act of illusionism. Magical. Uh, yes, there is something which is not of the prosaic uh, world, the everyday world. There is some kind, some ring of something that happened that is a stranger, that is, but still it's logical. It's logical and wonderful. So you end up shaking your head thinking it was fantastic. I, well, yes, maybe he will say that art is achieved uh, when the reader uh, turns the book again to the bookshelves with yeah. a smile of satisfaction. Okay. <laughs> very good. Well, that's what I have right now. Thank you, well, thank you for so a much. satisfactory, <laughs> very satisfactory interview. Well, thank you so much. I've been speaking with uh, Guillermo Martinez in his apartment in Buenos Aires. Thanks again. Thanks.